You know, when we talk about one field to another, one of those things that's always come about for me is, how did I get there? Everybody asks that question. How did, how did you go from, let's see, this guy, you know, NFL guy, looking here in the sunlight, showing my spell, looking around, like I said, at 80,000. Seems fantastic. It's a great, great, great thing. To a guy who spends most of his time here. That is actually my oldest daughter a few years ago, the year we bought the farm. So <clears throat> how do you get there? How did I grow into this particular space? Especially, you know, first and foremost, not having a lick of agricultural sense. <laughs> so, and by the way, they always say, if you ever want to see a million dollar farmer, start with a two million dollar farmer. There you go. <laughs> That's a good one, right? <clears throat> so let's start with this guy up here. If you don't know, the guy on the left is, is my dad, not the guy on the right. <laughs> Get that together. Actually, the guy on the right is a, a very good family friend. His name is Udo, and his wife is sitting across. Uh, his, her name is Ushi. These are friends of ours from Germany, and my mom is actually sitting across from my dad here in this picture. Uh, this is the guy that kind of began it all for me. My dad was a military guy. How many people, military family or been military? This is growing up bratty, right? You, you go out every single day, and you know that your dad's in the military. You never really know what he does. My dad was a mechanic. I found that out when I was 12. That's all that really mattered, right? But one thing my dad did do is he never put in for stateside orders. He always wanted to go overseas. He always saw this as an opportunity for him to see the world and his family to see the world, unlike he had, he had not been able to do as a child. So he took full advantage of that. So, oh, oh I skipped ahead a second. Jumped on me there. We'll go back to this. But uh, one of the things that my dad did is because of this, I got to see so many different cultures and experience so many great things. You know, one of my fondest memories as a kid growing up, and even though we were a military family, my parents always chose to live off base and in the towns that were nearby. That gave me great cultural advantage. And although it did uh, put me in a little bit of a bind when I was first growing up, right, trying to make sure I learned the language. But <clears throat> I always had to, a great experience in that. And in doing so, one of my fondest memories is going down the street, you know, every morning going to my bus stop and, and getting ready to go to class. And I'd stop and I'd grab my, my Deutschmark and go to, the, go to the baker and say, hey, I want my sweet bread, and I want some Nutella on that, and I'm going to go to school. That's what's going to get me going. You know, most kids start with cereal. I start with German sweet bread Nutella. That was great. <clears throat> so in that, I got to experience, you know, the understanding of what life was about for us, how it was, and going to experience the family settings of dinner, you know, the understanding that you, you cooked at home. You made great meals. The butcher shop was down the street. The, as I said, the bread maker's down the street. You went and picked things out of people's gardens and you know, paid them for it right there at the corner. That was great. That was most of my childhood. So when we were, when I was about 12, uh, 11 or 12, my dad was retiring. I have a, also have a sister who's 10 years older than me, so she's, she was definitely like my other mother, so I can never get away with anything. You don't know how bad that is. But when I was you know, 11, 12, when my dad was retiring. We were moving back to the States, stateside. And when I get here, first thing I notice is there's not really like a good place to just walk down the street and get that fresh bread. There wasn't a place for me to go to the butcher shop, you know, essentially, and pick out you know, a great steak or some ground beef for dinner or grab a chicken, whatever it was. So that's when I asked myself, why do people think this way? Why is this the right thing to do? Because I, all of a sudden, I, got, I came to an environment where we didn't spend as much time at home you know, eating our meals. We were kind of forced to either go trek out to find something and go figure out how we were going to put that meal together. <coughs> didn't know exactly how to do that. So as I grew up, you know, I became this guy, and I, I was still kind of on that whole ideal. Because, again, going back, the greatest thing that my dad's whole, my youth was taught to me, I should say, is that it taught me to cover my plate. You know, a lot of times we talk about how to teach kids 
what to eat and what to eat well, well, that was one of the things that just naturally happened to me. I was that kid who was like, please give me Brussels sprouts. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Still can't figure it out. But why didn't everybody else think this way? Couldn't figure that part out. So as I grew up, became this NFL athlete that everybody's all yay, roar, way, yay about. I'm, I'm excited about that part. I love my job. love that game. But the part that kind of concerned me was even there, when I got to that level, you see guys who didn't know how to handle that. They didn't know how to understand how to handle their bodies in that, in that sense. I came into the league in an era where you have a mass use of supplements, guys trying to improve themselves, trying to figure things out. You know, performance enhancing drugs became a bigger issue, and it's still something that's it's a struggle. And then there was me. I sat there and go, I can't risk this. I can't risk putting my, my potential career on the line like that. I can't do it. I couldn't see myself doing it. And then the other thing is, I still liked everything on the plate. And I was doing OK. I really, rarely got injured, rarely missed a game. You know, from 12 years as an NFL athlete, it's hard to miss, not to miss a few games. I missed four. That's really hard to do. And on average, you know, when you're playing 1,600 snaps a season, that's a lot of running, moving, and shaking, if you know what I mean. Especially at the linebacker position. I got to hit big guys, small guys every single play. So <clears throat> when I started asking that question, I came to this blank slate. How do I figure this out? What works for me? What is a, a great thing that I can do? Hmm. Well, I planted the seed, right? That's what got me started. Gave me the basis for what I needed to do. I need to figure out how to, how to do something good for myself and, and show people that there's a way to do things right. There's a way to, to create what you want to create. So here's where we start. I bought my first piece of property, and this is really comical, for two horses. So I went out and bought the first piece of property for two horses, and I have this great tax guy who's like, you know what? You got to get cows. You just got to get some cows. We can figure it out. It's great for taxes. You're going to be OK. <laughs> I'm thinking, yes. He's going to save me money. No, I had to spend it first. But uh, you know, the great thing is, I bought this first piece of property. Now, you see all these cows out here? That's kind of hilarious now. Because I went to buy two cows, and I came home with 16. <laughs> I didn't know what to say about that. I was really just kind of wondering, hmm, well, I guess I better start learning how to raise cows. And, and this kind of reverted me back to Oh, yeah. Well, I did say I wanted to know where, where things came from and be, feel good about that butcher shop I was taking things through. So my first thought was, I'm going to make my own beef. I'm going to be the man. I'm going to have my own beef. It's good. I can feel all right about it. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so as I, as I got into that, as I really started thinking about it, you know, I started understanding that I had my teammates who were like, man, you got this farm. Like, what's going on with that? I was like, yeah, I'm making, I'm growing cows. I'm doing great things and feeling fantastic about it. These guys were, were excited, and they kind of looked at me kind of funny, you know, as if I had Stephen or Kale glasses on. What are you doing? That's the, that was the question I had to kind of get them over the hump on. But over time, one of the best things I did was I created this. So... Shiregate Farm, as you see, and actually, remember my dad? He's still out there on the farm, hanging out. That's my dad's retirement gift, right? Like, I get to say, thanks, Dad, for doing these great things for me. Now there's something I know you enjoy, too. So I created Shiregate, and I started with 185 acres. I've now got over 700 acres and a network of farmers that I work alongside. This is kind of the, the epitome of sustainability, is, is the, the goal to show people that things can be done the most appropriate way possible and done on a scale that is sensible for everyone in this room to enjoy. I've got what they can consider a small farm. You know, most people think 700 acres is not small, and it's not because you're looking at a map section if you look at it. That's a good piece of land. You see everything I've encompassed in here. But 
I did need some guidance. I won't say I didn't. So you see the little seal up there, the AWA? I wonder if this is my little pointer. But that little AWA seal up there. So AWA is animal welfare approved. They did this great job of educating me on how to become a good, sustainable farmer. And that's what I wanted to be. That was where I showed my, my promise. And all the while, while I got to grow this and, and do that, I had my teammates ask me, man, now they started going, oh, you know, you said you were making beef. Can I get some of that? Oh, man, can I get some steaks? Oh, man, do you know where I can get, uh, you know, my wife doesn't eat red meat, but can you help me find some chicken? Can you help me find this? Uh, you know, it, it becomes this whole other gift that I was ex excited about, passionate about. I got to understand that, guys, I can lead the way in a wholly different manner. I was ecstatic about that. But there are bigger things. So a lot of times people wonder and ask me, you know, other than your dad and you enjoying yourself, and this was your job, so, you know, if you're trying to stay in your job, people tend to do what they want to do for their job. I got bigger motivation. So, you see all these kids on the left? My left, I should say, you're right. So, there's six of them, and number seven's over here on the right. <laughs> so, you see, there's my, a lot of my motivation, because... One of the things that happens as you're a professional athlete is you go around the world and you go around in your environments and you're speaking to schools and kids. One of the things that kept happening to me is when I started talking a little bit about some of the extracurriculars I did, you know, like my farm, they started asking, I started asking them, like, well, where do you know where, where chicken comes from? You know, where, where beef comes from? And when kids start answering Jewel Osco or Kroger or Publix, I'm like, wait, 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 let's, let's try and back that up. Where does it come from before it gets there? Well, a lot of kids said the freezer. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm having to steadily change that. And that's what I want to do with my kids, too. So, Shiregate's not only a place where I can live out a dream of, you know, taking farm to plate, farm to table, food, you know, farm to fork, however you want to describe it. It is also a place where I get to educate my kids every day. You know, my kids are busy in sports just like everybody else's, but... You know what, they know what it's like to get up in the morning, you know, they'll get up at the crack of dawn and run down the chicken coop before I even have to roll out of bed, because thank goodness they are that old, yes. <clears throat> but they'll go down the coop and go get what they want. Go, go grab their eggs out of the coop and say, hey, we're, we're gonna start working on breakfast. Now, what that breakfast may be, I'm not exactly sure all the time, because they tend to do some things, right? But, you know, that is one of my biggest motivators. That is one of the things that keeps me going forward you know, on this conquest. Not just the fact that I can be a voice for sustainable agriculture, because in, through AWA, I work with 4,500 other farmers. And I'm not talking about large you know, commercial farms. I'm talking about the average farm size is 40 acres, 60 acres, 80 acres. And all of those farmers are, are just everyday people wanting to make the move wanting to teach the movement, wanting to bring people forward, wanting to show you exactly how things can be done. Why can't I use that voice I had as a professional athlete and have as an ex-professional athlete to forward that ideal? One of the funnier things about it is I laughed until I cried at times because I ended up laughing about my buddy Andrew. I said, Andrew, this is going to be awesome. You get to speak at TEDx. Guess who's at TEDx? <laughs> That's how I felt about it. I'm, I'm laughing hysterically about that. But again, using that voice you know, to speak out in, in plenty of congressional meetings uh, and, you know, out and be outspoken towards the congressmen and women about how we can do this, how we can be, be forward thinkers, how we can take this going, going forward and eliminate the, the, the blind spots in between. How are we going to do that? Because... For me, I looked at it like this. I set the foundation, or the foundation was set in me, I should say, by my father and his experiences that he gave to me. So it's my goal to set those foundations in my children, and it's their goal to spread the word too and take that forward. I actually had to laugh because this was something that just came up the other day. We all talk about the old adage, right, like you double a penny every day, and at the end of a month, you got a million dollars, right? 
That's, that's always the great, great ordeal. Well, put this same concept, you know, well, with me, you know, of course, the, the number one crazy concept is if I double those every day, we'll have a million children, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of comical. But changing this focus and coming back here, if everybody thought about this every day and shared it with two other individuals, right, what kind of impact does that have? What kind of change can we have? I've changed teammates. I've changed friends. I've changed individuals who I've had slap arguments about, about how to do things appropriately and how we can benefit by doing so. These are guys that are 360 pounds. I'm not 360 pounds, okay? I'm strong and I'm fast, so I had to duck that right hook when he tried to give it to me, but we're good. We made it. But the greatest thing I can give is just pushing that forward, helping them and educating them and doing that today. You know, this is yet another group that I get to share with, that I get to share my story with. And hopefully, many of you are seeing the change that needs to come. Hopefully, many of you are seeing exactly what impact we can make. And that impact is the enlightenment of understanding that we all have a, a, a role in this, a role in everything that, is, that Shiregate's about. And I promise that I will take my voice as far as it will take me to keep that alive. Thank you.